This presentation covers IDESS Topic 3.4, Conservation of Biodiversity under the main Topic 3 of Biodiversity and Conservation. Why does a country or region consider conservation efforts? Well, it depends on their environmental value systems. Recall that an environmental value system is a world view that shapes the way an individual or group of people perceives and evaluates environmental issues. We've already studied environmental values in Topic 1. Now we will apply these views to conservation. Approaches to conservation can be ecocentric or nature-centered. <clears throat> they can be anthropocentric or people-centered. Or they can be technocentric, technology-centric, centered. All values have a focus on conservation, but for different reasons and using possibly different approaches. In caring about biodiversity, ecocentrics, anthropocentrics, and technocentrics focus on different reasons for conserving biodiversity, which we will now discuss. Ecocentrics consider that species have intrinsic value. The intrinsic importance could be influenced by culture, religion, economics, sociopolitical context. Do all species have a right to exist beyond any human values? Do you care whether the San Joaquin fox or the purple pig-nosed frog exists? Do some species have greater value than others? Do humans have a right to drive a species to extinction? Furthermore, ecocentrics might argue that biologically diverse ecosystems help preserve their component species, thus reducing the need for conservation efforts. The ethical arguments are of ecocentrics are often very broad, and they do rely on people believing that species have intrinsic value or on people taking a utilitarian approach. Recall, intrinsic value is the value a species has within its own right, as opposed to the value it can give. Utilitarianism involves taking the best moral action that maximizes happiness and minimizes suffering to entities involved. Anthropocentric views consider conservation in light of economic or commercial value. Crops and plants can provide medicines for people. In fact, forest plants provide medicines worth billions of dollars a year. The natural capital of forests also has commercial value in light that these logs can be used to make paper or building material. Remember though, in order to sustainably harvest the wood, the rate of harvest must be equal or less than the rate of replacement. Fibers with the potential use to people is another example of economic and commercial value of biodiversity. Here is an example of many different fibers coming from different plant materials that can be used for clothing, ropes, and other objects useful for humans. Remember, in order to sustainably utilize these different plant fibers, the rate of replacement must be equal to or greater than the rate of harvest. When rapeseed, used to make canola oil, is pollinated by bumblebees that thrive in open crop landscapes, the seed weight can increase over 80% thus yielding a higher financial return. Again, economic or commercial benefit is dependent on biodiversity. Diversity also has economic value with regard to tourism. Living elephants or lions bring in tourism dollars that far outweigh, over time, the price of their meat or other parts that because could be sold by killing the animal. The simple beauty of nature appeals to people. People enjoy nature with all of their senses. Humans find joy and wonder in nature and interacting with nature. Being in nature can be renewing, so there is the aesthetic value of biodiversity. In addition to the aforementioned benefits that biodiversity has to humans, biodiversity also provides platforms for science and education. Greater genetic diversity allows for hybridization and genetic engineering. Scientists can create plants with greater photosynthetic ability or tolerance to cold or salinity. Some species also provide control of invasive species, providing a built-in biocontrol and eliminating the needs of chemicals. Ecological services that biodiversity offers includes vegetation cycling, like, like carbon, regulating climate, regulating flood control, 
protecting soil and water quality, or decomposers breaking down waste and recycling. Remember, in order for these ecological services to be provided, the ecosystem must be intact. The list here is enormous. In addition to tourism, there is also simple recreation like hiking and camping. Also, in protecting biodiversity, indigenous tribes can continue to live in them and make a living. Finally, there are future uses that we might not even know about now. So there's, here's a pretty comprehensive list as to why we should conserve biodiversity. The actual economic value is difficult to estimate. But, for example, a paper published in 2015 estimated the value of a mangrove forest alone to be over 350 million U.S. dollars a year. It's difficult to actually quantify the value of ecological systems worldwide, but attempts are being made. We can estimate the costs associated with removing biodiversity. For example, society must bear the costs of deforestation through having to clean up the water, repair damaged soil, and bear the additional costs of compensating for what that forest would have done, such as maintaining flood control, providing pollinators to farmers, or regulating climate. Society bears the financial burdens of floods, lack of pollination, and climate change. What is the role of technocentrics in caring about biodiversity? A technocentrics view of biodiversity involves solving the problems of biodiversity loss through technology. For example, this group is working on a robot that can maneuver the service of a rhinoceros so that they can perform IVF on the two remaining white rhinos of Africa, hoping to prevent the extinction of these animals. It is very easy for those in a developed country to judge people in developing countries who are doing things they consider evil, but realize that a poacher can make almost 10,000 pounds from the tusks of an adult male elephant. The average annual salary in Kenya is around 612 pounds. It is important to understand that these arguments are not black and white. This is why conservation often includes engaging the local community and providing jobs for them in the conservation effort. Rainforests primarily are located in LEDC countries, lower economically developed countries. Resources are exploited because resources are needed to lift the welfare of the people. There is priority on economic growth, not conservation, and there are limited resources for protecting natural resources or conservation efforts. So, Also, LEDC have high population growth, therefore natural pressure on natural ecosystems. But, as I've mentioned, there are many arguments for conserving biodiversity. The reality is that the impact of losing biodiversity drives conservation efforts. Arguments for preservation and conservation are based on justifications that are aesthetic, ecological, economic, and ethical. There are, a ver there are various approaches to the conservation of biodiversity with associated strengths and limitations. There are many types of organizations involved in conservation. IGOs, or intergovernmental organizations, GEOs, or governmental organizations, and NGOs, or non-governmental organizations. Intergovernmental examples include the United Nations Environmental Program, the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, and the Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change. These organizations are composed of and answering to a group of member states or countries and are also called international organizations. The IUCN, or International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is composed of more than 160 countries with thousands of members and scientists. The famous NGO WWF is affiliated with the IUCN. The IUCN is also responsible for creating and maintaining the Red List, a dynamic site that catalogs and documents the conservation status of thousands of species. The IUCN also engages in campaigns to raise awareness regarding the importance of conservation. The United Nations Environmental Program 
is the conversation, conservation face of the United Nations and has been foundational in, gener in the generating of agreements between countries such as the International Plant Protection Convention, the Convention on Wetlands, the World Heritage Convention, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, Convention on Conservation of Migratory Species, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. The Convention on Biological Diversity advocates for the conservation of genes, species, and ecosystems. One of the most successful international agreements of uh, the UNEP is the Convention of the International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, a species-based conservation program in which governments voluntarily sign up and enforce their own laws to support the aims of CITES, to ensure the, that international trade of specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten their survival. Roughly 5,800 species of animals and 30,000 species of plants are protected by CITES. Species are grouped according to how threatened they are by international trade. An Appendix 1 grouping is a full ban of all trade of the species. An Appendix 2 grouping limits trade to ensure sustainability of the trade. An Appendix 3 grouping is at the request of a country which then needs cooperation of other countries. As a traveler, it is important to not purchase items from the banned list, such as ivory from telephant tusks, elephant tusks, tiger or rhino parts, and all sea turtle pro pr products. For other products in the wild, check to see that the seller has a CITES license. If you purchase products of threatened species, you encourage the market that further drives the species to extinction. Be aware of the decisions you make. Government organizations. Government organizations are part of and funded by a national government. They are usually highly bureaucratic and they engage in research, regulation, monitoring, and control activities. Costa Rica's national organizations have managed to place 25% of its land under protection in parks and reserves. This compared to the U.S.'s 1.8%. A park can be either ecocentric, the strictly focusing on the preservation of animal and plant species, or anthropocentric in its motives, focusing on drawing billions of dollars from the tourist industry. The U.S. Government Environmental Protection Agency states that people in every small community in America will have clean air, drinking water, um, waste disposal of and related services that safeguard their health in a friendly and sustainable environment. The U.S. government was also responsible for the Endangered Species Act, which enforces fines and jail time for endangered species harmed on private property. The Kenya Wildlife Service is a governmental organization that conserves and manages Kenya's wildlife for its people and the world. This statement has been issued by the Kenya Wildlife Service. The challenges facing wildlife and biodiversity in Kenya include climate change, habitat degradation and loss, forest depletion, tourism market volatility, human wildlife conflict brought by population growth, and changing land use habits of communities that coexist with wildlife, as well as wildlife crime. Non-governmental organizations. NGOs are not part of a government. They are not for profit. They may be funded um, on an international or local level. Also, they are funded by altruists or by subscriptions. Some are run by volunteers, and the many NGOs are very diverse. An example of an NGO is Greenpeace. In order to understand specific NGOs, take a look at their mission statements. For example, Greenpeace states, that Greenpeace exists because this fragile earth deserves a voice. It needs solutions. It needs change. It needs action. To maintain its independence, Greenpeace does not accept donations from governments or corporations, but relies on contributions from individual supporters and foundation grants. 
Greenpeace takes an activist approach to conservation. WWF states, we seek to instill people everywhere in a discriminating yet unabashed reverence for nature and to balance that reverence with a profound belief in human possibilities. WWF works in partnership with others to protect and restore species and their habitats, to ensure that the value of nature is reflected in decisions made by individuals, communities, governments, and businesses, to strengthen local communities' ability to conserve natural resources they depend upon, to transform markets and policies to reduce the impact of production and consumption of commodities. You need to be able to compare and contrast the role and activities of international government and non-governmental organizations in conserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. And in this context, consider the use of media, speed of response, diplomatic constraints, image, enforceability, and influence and funding of these different organizations. I will do a quick run through on these concepts. The use of media, IGOs and GOs have statements written by officers and clerks and they work alongside the official media outlets. NGOs will provide shocking and graphic footage to gain media attention. They mobilize public protests to attract attention and they have a very effective use of social media to spread their message. They seek to sabotage events with high media coverage. Both publish a scientific report. The speed of response is considered very slow because of the bureaucracy of IGOs and GOs. Because they might go against public opinion, there are many views that had to have to be considered. In contrast, NGO can be very rapid in their response. And since members only join organizations that they um, share opinions with, there's little deliberation. There's little consideration of the status quo. It's all about moving forward. There are considerable diplomatic constraints on IGOs and GOs. Also, the decisions can be politically driven since they are funded by governments. NGOs, however, are not affected by political constraints. And in fact, sometimes they can even include illegal activity. They are driven by what's best for conservation, which can lead to extreme actions. Financial resources are highly variable among both groups. They can be potentially very large um, for IGOs and GOs since they're funded by national budgets. NGOs are publicly um, managed and owned. They rely on private donations and they can be funded by governments um, companies or political par parties. However, some explicitly refuse this. Political influence. Some countries have more power than others. Biodiversity is not equally spread among all countries, influencing, of course, that political influence. Countries can be fined or shunned for breaking international rules. Uh, the political influence of NGOs varies greatly depending on their reputation and how popular they are. They often rely on disruptive or embarrassment techniques to cause change. The following slides on conservation milestones contain a list of dates and what happened. You do not need to know the dates or exact events. You do need an idea of how the world comes together to elicit change and how effective these in interventions have been. In 1980, we had the World Conservation Strategy, which seeks to maintain essential ecological processes and life support systems to preserve genetic diversity and to ensure sustainable utilization of species and ecosystems. In 1991, we had Caring for the Earth, a strategy for sustainable living, striving to state benefits of sustainable use of natural resources and sharing resources more equally. The 1992 Rio Earth Summit established a conservation of biological variation, sustainable use of its components, equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. In 2000, the UN Millennium Summit, Millennium Development Goals, world leaders agreed on a set time bound and measurable, bound by measurable goals. Many issues including poverty, hunger, gender equality. The World Summit of 2005 in New York outlined global priorities and recommended each country prepare a national strategy for the conservation of natural resources. 2010 was a realization that 
the um, agreements of 2001 by the European Union heads of states to halt biodiversity decline by 2010 had failed. 2013, another Rio summit, how to build a green economy resulted in a non-binding paper, the future that we want, but goals that people are striving for. Now let's talk specifically about approaches to conservation. There are three main approaches, species-based, habitat-based, or a mixture of both. Conservation efforts are more successful if they involve research, have adequate funding, and if they have support of the local community. Historically, the leaders of countries often showed their power by keeping a variety of exotic beasts, known as royal menageries. Heads of states would gift each other exotic animals, and the first zoos were then when these were opened to the public. Since then, zoos and aquaria have to justify their existence. This usually takes place in the form of captive breeding and funding conservation alongside education. Kew Gardens in London is the largest botanical garden in the world. It contains 25,000 plant species, 10% of the world's total. Seed banks are where seeds are stored and frozen, kept dry for many years. The Global Seed Vault in Svalbard is secu a secured seed bank to act as an insurance against loss of other seed banks. No power is needed to maintain this seed bank. Flagship species are charismatic, recognizable, and popular. Yet they are not necessarily ecologically important, but they attract funding for areas that need conservation efforts and are thus referred to as umbrella species. Disadvantage of naming flagship flagship species, it takes priority over others, even if it is not the most in need. If they become extinct, it sends a message that we have failed, and they might be in conflict with local people, for example, man-eating tigers. A keystone species has a critical role in maintaining the structure of the ecosystem it lives in. Disappearance of this species could cause the disappearance of many others. If conservation is to be successful, these species must be identified. Keystone species are often engineers, like beavers, that, that create habitats, or small predators, like sea otters, that keep herbivore numbers, such as urchins, low enough that producers, kelp forests, can survive. Let's look at a specific example of an attempt to increase biodiversity in a park. The famous example of the reintroduction of the keystone species, wolves, to Yellowstone National Park in the Northwest United States. The reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park resulted in a cascade of effects. The wolf, a keystone species, kept the elk and deer moving, preventing them from eating away all the vegetation at the river's edge. With vegetation, the banks of the river became stabilized and the water was cleared of silt. With wolves killing deer and elk, scavengers like eagles, ravens, and even grizzly bears had food to eat and joined the ecosystem. The wolves also killed off some of the coyotes so that now there were more rodents providing prey for foxes, eagles, and badgers bringing more diversity to the ecosystem. The added vegetation also brought in the beavers they are dams provided pools of water attracting fish and along with the vegetation more birds. The reintroduction of the wolf increased the diversity of the ecosystem, which brought definitely more stability. Now we'll talk about how we design protected areas. You should be able to describe the considerations in locating habitats in need of protection and be able to explain the criteria for consideration when designing protected areas, including size, shape, edge effects, corridors, and proximity to potential human influence. Here is an overview of the considerations in selecting and conserving areas in need of protection. We will talk about location and design criteria. Let's start with the consideration of location. In this slide, you see maps of Canada, the US, Germany, and Peru, and the national parks located on each map. If you look carefully, you see that all of the parks are located away from areas of high human population. Another consideration might be whether there is a high amount of biodiversity that exists at the location. Should only richness and abundance be considered? Or what about the endemism, the amount of species unique to that location? 
What about areas that are already identified as hotspots? Should they be protected? In this slide, you can see the chain of mountains that stretches down the west coast of South America from Bolivia to Chile. It is home to one-sixth of all plant life on Earth, on just 1% of the planet's landmass. More than 660 amphibian species call the tropical Andes home. In 2004, 450 of those were listed as threatened by the IUCN. The critically endangered yellow-tailed woolly monkey, once thought extinct, roams the moist cloud forests of the Andes, as does the only bear in South America, the spectacled bear. Should this area be protected? What about areas on Earth that are undisturbed by humans, or that are really rare? Or what about areas that are already threatened by human activity? Should these areas all be conserved? Now let's look at design criteria for conservation of an area. Consider first the size of the park or reserve. Recall that as you sample larger and larger areas to determine species diversity, you increase the likelihood of sampling rare species. At some point, all species have been sampled, so the diversity plateaus. In designing the size of a conservation park, you want to make sure that it's large enough to contain all species of the region you are trying to protect. The bigger the area, the greater diversity. Thus, it's been suggested by scientists that parks should be greater than 4,000 square kilometers. Here is a list of some of the world's largest parks. Unfortunately, there are many parks that are much, much smaller than this. Many of these parks are also far away from human populations. However, a park like Tsavo in Kenya might be surrounded by small villages. This is something to keep in mind. Of the 59 national parks in the United States, only four in the lower 48 are larger than 4,000 square kilometers. Those are Yellowstone, Death Valley, Grand Canyon, and the Everglades. There are several in Alaska that are also quite large. Now, let's look at the shape of some of these parks. Notice this park here in South Dakota, the Badlands, how it is long and thin versus Yellowstone that is big and round or almost squarish. The Badlands Park has a much larger edge to area ratio. Those that are round have much, much less edge to area ratio. The edge is where invasive species could have access, where people might intrude. The natural e ecosystem gives way to humans at the edge. So more edge equals less diversity, and less edge equals greater diversity. Let's look at the influence of, of size of the park on edge to area ratio. In this diagram, you can see a calculation of the edge to area ratio of a small area versus a large area. Small versus large. The larger area, the smaller, has the smaller um, edge to area ratio. The bigger one, the bigger the better because the edge to area ratio is less. Remember, the edge is the region of vulnerability. Reducing the edge to area ratio increases biodiversity. Two slides ago, I explained that round or square is better than long and thin because it reduces the relative amount of edge to the area. It reduces the edge to area ratio. Here is a calculation to illustrate that two areas of equal area might not have the same edge to area ratio. Notice that the longer shape has a higher edge to area ratio. Reducing the edge is ideal, but conservationists will do the best they can to protect species and ecosystems. For example, the Badlands National Park in South Dakota that I pointed out earlier is aligned along a range of steep canyons. It protects bison and bighorn sheep. If it must be long and slender to accommodate the region, then that's how it is. Which is better, one large park or many small parks of the same total area? Hopefully you can see that the edge to area is smaller in one large park. Biodiversity will be greater in one large park than in several smaller parks because the edge to area ratio is smaller here and smaller edge to area ratio therefore means more biodiversity. A larger edge to area ratio means less biodiversity. In this slide, hopefully you can see the benefit of a park being close 
in proximity or near to another park or parks, or that there is benefit to be connected to other parks through what we call corridors. Close proximity and corridors allow for opportunities of colonization or recolonization if a species has gone extinct. Also, if a corridor can be built and maintained, it allows for genetic flow, maintaining genetic diversity. Gene flow in between parks increases genetic diversity, important in long-term evolutionary success. Again, corridors provide for an increase in genetic diversity. A clear design model would include a core zone that remains unvisited. It is left alone for the needs of the species within the park, off limits to people. At a first buffer zone would allow for scientific research. A second buffer zone would allow for tourists. Tourist dollars sustain the cost of protection, guards, education centers, science, captive breeding efforts, etc. Possibly, possibly there is also a transition zone for the sustainable harvest of resources for the local community. Here is another example of clear design with a core buffer zone and an area planned for sustainable harvest of resources. We did some biodiversity studies in Gorongosa National Park. Here is a visual of how the park is built in buffer zones for sustainable development for the local community. To recap this movie, we talked about the arguments for conservation of biodiversity from both the ecocentric viewpoint, where species deserve conservation efforts for ethical reasons and because they have intrinsic value, the anthropocentric approach is to conserve biodiversity because of all the benefits humans obtain from biodiversity, the organizations involved in species and habitat conservation are the IGOs, GEOs, and NGOs, we talked about the approaches to conservation, species versus habitat based or a combination of the two. We talked about CITES, captive breeding zones and zoos, botanical gardens, and seed banks and protected areas. We discussed the design of protected areas focusing on location and size and shape of parks and reserves. This ends the movie for IBESS Topic 3.4, Conservation of Biodiversity. The slides were adapted from William Green's presentation on the site from The Amazing World of Science with Mr. Green. The Amazing World of Science is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution International License. Additional insight was obtained from Mr. Dave Hoover's movie presentations at Hoover's YouTube channel. Both of these sites provide additional resources for study and learning. Another resource for you is your IBESS textbook whether in hardback form or online such as Cognity. Thank you for listening.